Politicians love to tell us that whatever election happens to be the next one is the most important election of our lifetimes. With Donald Trump as president, that stump speech line actually carries weight, particularly when you have neo-Nazi and fascist attacks on Jews because they're Jews or on African-Americans because they're African-Americans. When you have pipe bombs being mailed to some of the leaders of the Democratic Party and its perceived bankrollers, when you have Brett Kavanaugh confirmed to a lifetime appointment on the highest court in the U.S., when the president openly encourages violence and spews racist propaganda, followed by attempts to legalize that violent hate. The Trump presidency adds urgency to so many battles that people have been fighting against both Democrats and Republicans for decades upon decades. It feels immediate. And let's be honest, for the most vulnerable people in our society, the danger is already here. But voting for Democrats is not a solution to anything. At best, it's an important effort to hold the line, to fight so that it doesn't get worse. But that act of, I voted for Democrats, only takes us so far. The rot in the American political system was not created by Donald Trump. He is a product of that system, a beneficiary of that system. If we're always put on the hamster wheel of U.S. electoral politics, nothing is ever going to fundamentally change in this system. The journalist Chris Hedges has spent the last decade and a half trying to ring the alarm about the dangers of the U.S. political system. And he writes about a corporate and financial coup d'etat that happened long ago in this country. Now, before Hedges embarked on this mission, he was a longtime war correspondent for The New York Times. In fact, he was part of the Pulitzer Prize winning team that covered the 9-11 attacks and the aftermath. Hedges' book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, remains a classic work for studying war journalism. Chris Hedges quit the New York Times after being reprimanded for his public denouncement of the Bush administration's invasion of Iraq. And that largely ended Chris Hedges' relationship with large, powerful media organizations. He's currently a columnist at Truthdig. He hosts a show on Russian television on RT America. And he teaches a college class at a state prison in New Jersey. In 2012, Hedges sued President Barack Obama in a case known as Hedges v. Obama over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Hedges said that that act would allow for the detention or rendition of U.S. citizens. Hedges won an injunction in that case, but the decision was ultimately overturned on an appeal filed by the Obama administration. Chris Hedges' latest book is America, the Farewell Tour, and he joins me now. Chris, welcome to Intercepted. Thanks, Jeremy. Is there a difference in your view between the Democratic and Republican parties, given everything we're seeing now in the era of Trump? Well, of course there's a difference. Um, It's how you want corporate fascism delivered to you. Uh, Do you want it delivered by a Princeton-educated Goldman Sachs criminal? Or do you want it delivered by a racist, nativist, Christian fascist? And this is essentially what the Trump administration – this is the ideology that the Trump administration has embraced because Trump has no ideology. So they're filling his ideological void. But, you know, and you've reported on this, the the fundamental engines of oligarchic global corporate power are advanced by both parties – And one attempts to present that in a kind of multicultural, inclusive way. The other is, you know, kind of embraced by troglodytes. But there's no way within the American political system you can in any way tame or challenge the war machine or Goldman Sachs or ExxonMobil. The Democrats' assault on civil liberties under Barack Obama, again, as you know well, uh, were worse than under George W. Bush. Um, the expansion of drone warfare, which again you reported on, was uh, all under the Obama administration. The reinterpretation of the 2002 Authorization to Use Military Force Act uh, was interpreted by the Obama White House to give them the right to assassinate American citizens, Anwar al 
and his 16-year-old son. And was his daughter also was killed, right? Uh, it, it's that old book was written 30 years ago, you know, Friendly Fascism. It's how you want it served up. And the press, of course, the commercial press has a vested interest in doing this. But we've personalized the problem in Trump without realizing that Trump is the product of a failed democracy. Trump is what rises up from the bowels of a decayed and degenerate system. And you can get rid of Trump, um, but you're not going to get rid of what the sociologist Emil Durkheim called that anime uh, that propels societies to engage in deeply self-destructive behavior, whether that's the opioid crisis. And this is the – my latest book is called America, the Farewell Tour, but it looks at these pathologies, these – what sociologists call diseases of despair and argues that until those social bonds are re-knit, until that enemy is confronted, um, not only are things not going to get better, um, but especially as we uh, are now on the cusp of another financial breakdown, they're going to get worse. Noam Chomsky, who consistently now for election after election has openly said that the only choice is to support the Democrats. And more recently, he's been saying that the the GOP, the Republican Party, is the single greatest threat to global stability or peace in the world. Uh, overwhelmingly, the uh, 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 Republican Party uh, is uh, uh, simply a major threat to not only to the country, but to human survival. I've said in the past that I think they're the most dangerous organization in human history. I don't agree with Noam on that issue. I think the problem is that, and I was very involved in the Nader campaign when he was running for president. I was a speechwriter and nobody's fought corporate power with more integrity and courage and foresight than Nader. And essentially, he was locked out of the legislative process when this corporate coup d'etat, which we have undergone, uh, essentially pushed out the liberal wing of the Democratic Party because Ralph would write this legislation. I think he wrote 24 pieces of legislation, the Mine and Safety Act, the OSHA, the Clean Water Act. All, all this was written by Nader, but then passed or pushed through by liberals. And I think the problem is that we on the left didn't take a stand. Politics is a game of fear and Ralph's argument was that 5, 10, 15 million people walk out on the Democrats. They will feel the pressure in the same way that the Democrats under Roosevelt with the breakdown of capitalism in the 1930s felt the pressure from not just the progressive party and the old CIO but also the Communist Party, which we have – I'm not a communist, I'm not, but I mean that Communist Party played a very important role in terms of putting pressure on the centers of power. Now, where Noam uh, is particularly prescient is understanding the role of the liberal class in a capitalist democracy. The liberal class functions as a kind of safety valve. It ameliorates the system to address the grievances and injustices, especially when they become particularly pronounced among the working class. So Roosevelt – who in his private correspondence, which were published after his death, he actually uses the word revolution. He says, if we don't respond to this crisis, since the private sector can't put people to work, the government must put people to work, then we will undergo revolution. This is Roosevelt's word. And he also said that his greatest achievement was that he saved capitalism. That's the role of the liberal class. Now, the, the radical movements – have been eviscerated and destroyed in the United States. And we had very, as you know, very militant radical movements, especially on the eve of World War I, uh, the old anarchist movements, the Wobblies, great figures, Mother Jones, uh, Big Bill Haywood. So the radical movements were destroyed. And then this was accelerated, of course, in the 1950s. And many, Ellen Schrecker has written a couple of good books on this. And there was, I didn't understand the extent of it till I read Schrecker. So you had the FBI going into high schools with lists of teachers with no evidence. Most of these people weren't even communists, um, but they were progressives and getting them fired. And then they were blacklisted. They could never teach again. If a person defends the activities of communist nations while consistently attacking the domestic and foreign policy of the United States, she may be a communist. But there are other communists who don't show their real faces, who work more silently. The purging of American society of anyone with a social conscience went quite deep. Then you saw the 1960s 
But in the 1960s, labor was divorced from the radical movements, which was fatal. Then the corporatists really made a huge push, the 1971 Powell memo. And so in their myopia, the capitalist class destroyed not just the radical movements, but eviscerated the liberal institutions, which created a kind of equilibrium within the capitalist system that offered an ability to address the most egregious problems. And this is, and this is now where we've ended up in, in the greatest income inequality in American history, the, the seizure of power by – and they're not even traditional capitalists. They don't make anything. They're all speculators, global speculators. That's what Goldman Sachs does. They've seized control of our economy and most economies. The breakdown that we experience has been bipartisan. Uh, Clinton was, of course, the poster child for this. Clinton understood that if he did corporate bidding, he would get corporate money. And of course, by the 1990s, fundraising parity with the Republicans was equal. And uh, when Barack Obama ran, first ran in 2008, he got more. So we've got to look at the structural issues. I mean, I find Trump as repugnant and repulsive as everyone else. Uh, but our problem is not embodied in the personality of Donald Trump. I think that there are there are two separate debates. They're related, but there are two separate debates to have. On the one hand, I think you and I share this view. Nothing is ever going to fundamentally change in this country of any worth until the two-party monopoly over the lives of our politics is shattered. It's just not going to fundamentally change. But then you have this other reality when it does seem like every election, and this is Obama was saying it just this week, is the most important of our lifetime. The most important election of our lifetimes. I, I know politicians always say that, but this time it's really true. <laughs> because America's at a crossroads. There's no doubt that Hillary Clinton would not have had Brett Kavanaugh on her court or Neil Gorsuch on her court. She probably would have been in potentially more wars than Trump is in right now, would have had a much more militaristic stance on a, a range of issues. But how do you reconcile those two discussions? On the one hand, this need to finally deliver a meaningful blow against the, the, the two-party system, and on the other hand, hold the line against things becoming even worse. Like It's hard to imagine a worse scenario than having Donald Trump and, and I think people need to always remember this, Mike Pence a radical right-wing Christian ideologue uh, who has his own forms of corruptions. But how do you reconcile those two things, It's Chris? causation. What caused it? And what caused it was the decision by the Democratic Party to sell out working men and women. So that's why the Democratic Party runs so close to the margins in every election. I mean, Trump should not be a political figure who mounts a credible challenge to a party that truly represents the interests of working men and women. But Pelosi, Schumer, they're all tethered to Wall Street and they won't address the fundamental issue, which is social inequality. And because they won't address it, they play to the margins. Um, and that's a very dangerous game, especially as we are – and even the New York Times ran an editorial a couple of weeks. We are definitely headed for – their polite term is an adjust, adjustment. Uh, we're headed for probably a crash that will – be as large as the 2008 crash from everything I can tell. And then what happens? Then the monsters really come out. I saw it in Yugoslavia. It was not a happy Easter in Sarajevo. This capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina continues to be the focal point of the latest chapter of the civil war in Yugoslavia. In recent days, the people of Sarajevo have been subjected to artillery and mortar attacks by Serbian militiamen and the regular Yugoslav, mainly Serbian army. And so it's short-term gain. The problem is that those of us who care about an open society and advancing the interests of the poor and the working class and even the middle class surrender every election cycle to the Democratic Party and therefore were utterly ineffectual. And we should have, of course, back when Nader was running in 2000, stepped out. And that's why it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Um, it's lonely. It's difficult. You're right about Kavanaugh. But if we really want to stop it, um, we're going to have to rise up against the machine. And those first few tentative steps 
will be very difficult. We're never not going to cure this in an election cycle. But we haven't even talked about climate change. I mean, the, the we are watching the a form of ecocide. I mean, the latest climate report was that the oceans have stored far more heat. I mean, so that means that if we stopped all carbon emissions today, we would still suffer catastrophic effects. I mean, the polar ice caps are there's an iceberg what twice the size of Manhattan or something that just broke off. I mean, the planet is disintegrating in front of our eyes. And the Democratic Party is not doing anything about it in anything meaningful. I mean, rhetorically, they recognize the reality reality of it, but it's a, a form of magical thinking to think that we're going to adjust or adapt or technology is going to save us just as it's magical thinking to think it doesn't exist. So our problems are far more severe. And while the Democratic leadership is not as radical as the kleptocrats and the Republican Party, they move in the same direction. They, they just move at a, at a slower pace. Uh, but we don't have time to play this game anymore. One of the, I think, legitimate lines of concern that I hear coming from people of color and women uh, about the idea of not voting for the Democrats uh, is that we can't afford to engage in the in the kind of thinking that Chris Hedges is laying out here or that Jill Stein was laying out or that Ralph Nader uh, is laying out because the threat to us is immediate. Uh, in the case of women uh, and access to abortion, it's immediate. In the uh, in the case of uh, police uh, brutality and extrajudicial killings of black people, it's immediate. And so you will hear this very intense level of concern or anger at the notion that you're using this particular election to sort of say the revolution starts now and we need to, at all costs, dismantle this system. But what what would you say to people who say, yeah, I get that. I can't afford to do that because I'm worried about losing access to abortion like next month. Well, let's begin with the system of mass incarceration and police terror. I teach in a prison and half of my students wouldn't be there but for Bill Clinton. That whole quote unquote law and order issue was seized by Biden and Clinton as they transformed the Democratic Party into the Republican Party and push the Republican Party so far to the right, it became insane. So in terms of people of color, in fact, it was the self-identified liberals of the Democratic Party. It, these were the three strikes, your outlaws, the tripling and quadrupling of sentences, the 1994 omnibus crime bill that poured, what, $300 billion into the prison system. It's all Democrats. Today, the bickering stops. The era of excuses is over. The law-abiding citizens of our country have made their voices heard. Never again should Washington put politics and party above law and order. In terms of abortion, that is a legitimate concern. I mean, we're going to have these guys on this court for a, well, a, a couple gonna, of generations. Well, it's clear. I mean, Kavanaugh was pushed by the Christian right um, because he will clearly abolish Roe v. Wade. I mean, that's why he's there. And that's why the Christian right made it very clear to the Trump administration, you must put him on. But are we going to rectify this political, economic, cultural, social dissent by every election cycle surrendering to the Democratic Party. And I think if you look at the last few decades, um, the proof is there. It is getting steadily worse and worse and worse. And we have to overthrow the corporate state. Um, we have to wrest power back into our hands. The Democratic Party, if it truly addressed social inequality in a real way, the way Bernie Sanders. I mean, the thing about Sanders and Trump, although Trump is a con artist, is that they both spoke about the reality that most Americans experience. And yet, if you turn on CNN, they will tell you the economy is booming. Well, booming for whom? I mean, the, the overheated stock market is not a sign of financial health. Go back and read John Kenneth Galbraith's book, The Crash. So, I mean, stock values are no longer in any way, real way related to the values of companies. We've pumped out $26 trillion in fabricated money and handed it to the banks. I mean, we could have paid for college tuition, uh, provided universal health care for all 
created, you know, a few million jobs and infrastructure projects, which is, of course, what Roosevelt did with the Depression. And so these structural issues, which are never addressed by the commercial corporate media because they are completely owned and run by corporations like General Electric, are the real issues. And I don't want to minimize the issue of taking control of your own body away from women. I don't want to minimize that in any way. And yet, by continuing to react through fear, and that's what really both parties do. The only thing they have to sell us is fear. But my argument, especially having covered Yugoslavia and seen it, is that with an irresponsible ruling elite, and the impending financial collapse. Right now, we live in a period of relative stability. But with that impending financial collapse, then we who care about the rule of law and oppose anarchic and nihilistic acts of violence and mass shootings, and we're finished. And that's exactly what happened in Yugoslavia because we didn't stand up and fight for anything, really. I mean, what is what is the Democratic Party's mantra? It's basically, we're not Trump. And that's, Hillary Clinton tried it, and it didn't work really well. And given the instability that is about to envelop us, it's time for us to step out and fight back. And it will be difficult, and a lot of people won't join us. But I think it's our only hope. When you talk about stepping out or fighting back or confronting that corporate takeover or this coup that are, that long ago happened with the corporations, uh, what, what do you mean? What I saw in Eastern Europe, uh, sustained acts of mass civil disobedience, non-cooperation in the words of the ANC in apartheid South Africa. The idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an idea for which I hope to live for. But my Lord, if it needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die doing everything we can to disrupt the mechanisms of the machine. Uh, and it works. I mean, I covered the fall of the Stasi state in East Germany. And when you had 500,000 people gathering day after day in Alexanderplatz, and, and it has to be nonviolent. I mean, this has been my persistent battle with the Black Bloc and Antifa, who are a gift to the security and surveillance state. Because as the theorists of revolution, and this is what I'm calling for is revolution. As the theorists of revolution, Crane Brinton, Jeffrey Davies, and others have written, no revolution succeeds unless a significant part of the ruling apparatus defects. You're appealing to the conscience. So Leipzig, September 1989, Eric Honecker, the communist dictator, sends down an elite paratroop division with the intention of firing on the demonstrators. And when they get there, the local communist authorities refuse to allow them to be deployed in the streets. Honecker's out of power within a week. Same thing in the Russian Revolution. I mean, read Lenin on, on anarchist violence. I mean, the guy was heartless and I'm with Chomsky. He was a counter-revolutionary, destroyed the Soviets and all that. But he certainly understood the mechanics of revolution. And he saw how those acts of violence played into the hands of the czarist state. So we have to build those kinds of movements, as I saw in Standing Rock, would be a good example. And it isn't going to be like the Women's March in Washington. When you truly defy their interests, as the water protectors did in Standing Rock, then they're vicious. So you had 700 arrests, uh, constant infiltration, drones flying over the camp, attack dogs, water cannons laced with pepper spray, but that, that's it. And, and if we just reduce everything to climate change alone, we don't have any time left. When Obama was president, you were a plaintiff in a lawsuit against Barack Obama. 
filing a complaint in Southern U.S. District Court against Barack Obama and Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta to challenge the legality of the NDAA. Their plaintiff is none other than veteran war correspondent and Pulitzer Prize winner Chris Hedges. And it's centered around the National Defense Authorization Act. And I think it's a particularly relevant story yeah. for you to explain, given the fact that Trump uh, and his administration seem to be indicating that they're going to toss posse comitatus out. That's uh, already been in destroyed. The, in I mean, the... that's what Obama did. So this is on people's mind now, but in the context of Donald Trump. So explain why you filed this lawsuit. And you, you were joined then by... Dan Ellsberg, right. Noam Chomsky, right. the journalist Alex O'Brien. There was a yep. whole list of people that right. were public figures, journalists, intellectuals, and others. Why did you sue Obama over the Na National Defense Authorization Act? Well, because he overturned the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act, which had prohibited the military from acting as a domestic police force. He signed it into law at around midnight on 2011. That Section 1021 allows the federal government, or the executive branch in particular, to carry out extraordinary rendition, to seize an American citizen who supports the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or something called, quote unquote, associated forces, whatever that is, and hold them indefinitely uh, in detention without due process until, quote unquote, the end of hostilities, which as we've seen in 17 years of warfare is forever. So it was a section part of the National Defense Authorization Act, which is renewed every year, designed, uh, I think because the elites understand how precarious the situation is, designed uh, at a, as a last resort to employ the military to crush any kind of domestic unrest. And I think that's because ultimately they don't trust the police to protect them. So I mean just anecdotally when a few years ago we had the teachers strike in Chicago, the teachers when they were marching through the streets of Chicago would go into the precincts of the police to use the bathrooms and the police would applaud. This terrifies the elite. Or when I, a few years ago, was arrested in front of the White House with 133 veterans from Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, it turns out that the Washington police, uh, most of them are in the National Guard. And as they would cuff us, they would say, keep protesting. And so that's why we have Section 1021. We won in the Southern District Court in New York. And then uh, the Obama administration immediately asked that the injunction, the temporary injunction, be lifted. And to her credit, Judge Catherine B. Forrest refused. Uh, they then went to the appellate or the Second Circuit, the next court up, uh, and got the injunction lifted in the name of national security. Now, it was fascinating. It was a two-year legal process after that. And it was fascinating to watch because here was a very clear black and white issue in the same way that privacy is a very black and white issue. I mean, once we had the Snowden revelations. Every time you want to get all warm and fuzzy about the Democrats, remember what they did to restore our right to privacy, which is zero. And what they ended up doing is what they always do, which is find a way to deny my right, my standing, my ability to bring the case. And the way they did that is that I was also a plaintiff in Clapper versus Amnesty International before the Snowden revelations where we challenged wholesale government surveillance, where government lawyers got up in the Supreme Court and not only denied that it was taking place, but told the court that if any of us were being surveilled, we would be informed. And so the, the, we waited months with the Second Circuit. That ruling came down. They threw it out. The Supreme Court threw it out, in essence, denying our standing. And then the Second Circuit said, well, he doesn't have standing in Clapper versus Amnesty International. Therefore, he doesn't have standing in Hedges v. Obama, and so we're rejecting it. We filed a cert or a petition to the Supreme Court, and they wouldn't take it. But during that two-year process, the lawyers approached the Democratic leadership, and Pelosi and said, because it's renewed every year, all you have to do is insert in there that this does not apply to U.S. citizens, and we drop the case. Well, they didn't insert that because that's what it was written for. And does it keep getting passed in the NDAA yeah. under yeah. Trump? Yes. So, so explain, well, explain in clear terms what this what what well, that means. What, what I'm watching is this ridiculous uh, deployment of you know what's the latest figure fifteen thousand yeah, fifteen thousand troops? troops to the U S Mexico uh, to border. the U S Mexico border. Barbed wire is, can be very beautiful if it's put up right. That's yeah. what Trump was saying. We're different. We more than Trump. We have our military now on the border. Uh, 
And I noticed all that beautiful barbed wire going up today. It was a barbed wire used properly can be a beautiful sight. All you have to do is declare these people as terrorists. You know, speaking of the Christian fascists, um, I was – the only time I see TV is at a gym or airport. But I flicked on the 700 Club uh, with Pat Robertson. You know, as we do. <laughs> right. Well, I was kind of curious how they were dealing with it. And of course, it was just what I expected where they were uh, splicing in photographs of uh, marching black clad jihadists carrying – uh, cradling automatic weapons with the caravan, which is a thousand miles from Texas. So we will see, uh, and we already are seeing uh, animal rights activists, environmental activists, all being tried under terrorism laws. And this section of the National Defense Authorization Act really at that point gives the executive branch the ability to completely militarize in a very formal way our society. I mean, we already have in marginal communities militarized police. They they are quasi, you know, paramilitary with, with not bound in any way by the rule of law. I mean, I think what is it, 3.1 of our citizens, almost all poor people of color are murdered every day on the streets of American cities, uh, almost all of them unarmed. Uh, but this brings it to a whole new level and it's just one more tool that – that the corporate totalitarians can employ. I find it fascinating that when Bush was president, you heard a lot of talk about the kind of theocratic nature of that administration. I think you could very effectively argue that theocratic right-wing Christian fascists, this is their golden era right now. Yeah. I would cite you to the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise command in Romans uh, 13, to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained, ordained the government for his purposes. With someone like Trump, you know, who's uh, – he's been married X number of times. He's right. – uh, he, he represents so much of what they claim to be against in terms of personal morality. But the mere fact that he sort of does the speech, I accept Jesus, it's like all is forgiven and Trump was sent by God. I do think that people are making a mistake not looking at the – theocratic drive of Mike Pence, the people that pushed him onto the ticket with Trump, and the fact that Trump won an election they probably would never have been able to win on their own, the radical Christian yeah. right and the elites of the Republican Party. I think Alan Nairn said it best. Trump dragged the, the ultra-right oligarchs kicking and screaming into power. They could never win an election on their own. Mike Pence was not going to get elected president right. in 2016 any more than he would in 2020. Well, as you know, 10 years ago, I wrote a book on the Christian right, American fascists, the Christian right in the war in America. I come out of a religious tradition. My father was a minister. My mother graduated from seminary and was a professor. And I graduated from Harvard Divinity School. So I'm steeped in that tradition. And I didn't use the word fascist lightly. Um, in fact, when I finished the book, I went to spend several hours with Fritz Stern, uh, one of the great scholars of fascism who wrote The Politics of Cultural Despair and fled Nazi Germany as a teenager, as well as Robert Paxton who wrote Anatomy of Fascism, the great Vichy scholar at Columbia. First of all, they're Christian heretics. I mean, you don't need to spend three years at Harvard Divinity School as I did to realize that Jesus did not come to make us rich or shower us with consumer products or bless the dropping of iron fragmentation bombs all over the Middle East. And – Inside these mega churches, um, they function as cults and these white male pastors who prey on the despair of their congregants for wealth. People like Joel Osteen are their you know, multimillionaires. And here's the whole key. After all God has done for us, freed us from slavery, defeated our enemy, if you don't see yourself the right way, it will keep you from your destiny. In the same way that Trump preyed on the despair of people within his casinos. People raise the issue, well, how can the Christian right build an alliance with Trump? And I would argue that in fact, um, they're completely alike. They're con artists. They manipulate the misery and despair of others. Uh, they perpetuate a form of magical thinking, magic Jesus. They attack reality-based science and re reality-based news. This all comes out of the, it all predates Trump. They are 
uh, fascism, as Paxton writes in The Anatomy of Fascism, it always comes draped in familiar, even comforting iconography and language. So Italian fascism harkened back to ancient Rome uh, and the glory of the Roman Empire. German fascism uh, harkened back to Teutonic myths and this. And we hearken back to the iconography and language of Christianity, the fusion of the, the sacralization of the state. So my great mentor at Harvard Divinity School, James Luther Adams, was in Germany in 1936 and 1937 at the University of Heidelberg. He watched Martin Heidegger begin his lectures with a Nazi salute. He dropped out. He joined the confessing church with Niemöller, Bonhoeffer, Schweitzer, Karl Barth, and others. And he took lots of home movie film, which uh, he was picked up by the Gestapo and thrown out of Germany a year later. And I watched that film as he narrated in his apartment in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But much of it was of the so-called German Christian church, which had on one side of the altar, the Christian cross, and on the other, the Nazi swastika. And Adams told me, and this was in the early 80s, or told us, when you're my age, he was then 80, you will all be fighting the Christian fascists. Because he understood that when you dispossess a working class, as we have done, and this was evident when I did the book on the Christian right. The real world becomes so oppressive. And you know, I did dozens of interviews with followers. You'd have to have a heart of stone not to be moved by their struggles with addiction and underemployment and sexual abuse and domestic abuse. And so this, this magic Jesus, this magical thinking is kind of the last protection that they have. So I was in Detroit doing an End Times weekend with uh, Tim LaHaye, who wrote the End Times series, and looking at uh, lust is the only word I can describe, this lust for apocalyptic violence. And I think I finally understood that that came from the euphoric desire to destroy the world that almost destroyed them. And at the end of the book, I said, you will not break this movement by trying to argue these people out of creationism. You will only break this movement by reintegrating these people into the economy and rebuilding the social bonds that have been destroyed so that they have a possibility of meaningful work, of self-actualization. You know, of all people, John Paul II wrote a very good encyclical about work. And Emil Durkheim's book on suicide talks about how those societies and individuals that have a propensity for self-annihilation are those for whom these social bonds no longer function. And of course, 10 years later, it's much worse. And so we have to address the root. We have to rebuild those social bonds if we're going to save us. <laughs> and by capitulating every election cycle to the Democratic Party, ultimately we ensure our own enslavement and without being melodramatic because of climate change, ultimately the extinction of the human species. You know, it's been interesting and, and, and I think extremely disturbing to watch how Trump, Pence, certainly Jeff Sessions, their preferred audience, certainly in the case of Trump, is not the troops. He has yet to set foot in a uh, in a foreign war zone, um, which is fairly unheard of, particularly post 9-11 for the commander in chief. But he's always talking to sheriffs somewhere or police officers somewhere. And, and you and I both know from, from our reporting going back decades, there is a large contingent of white supremacists in the U.S. Yes, military and certainly among yes, uh, uh, police officers and sheriffs and others. But what Trump and company are doing is really showing, uh, and Trump said it the other day, where, you know, where are my bikers, my cops? You know, they list it off and it's, you, you do get a sense that they know they have their brown shirts that are actually in official uniforms that uh, when the day comes are going to be on their side, no matter what the African-American put in as their captain tells them to yeah, do or true. not to do. You know, rhetoric is important. So we're watching Trump incite violence because he, none of his policies have any support. His tax cuts don't have support, his assault on Obamacare, his refusal to raise the minimum wage. None of this has any. All he has is hate. And that's the only weapon he'll use. And I look at this attempt to decapitate, in essence, murder the Democratic leadership through these pipe bombs as very, very ominous because I saw it in Yugoslavia. And not only will this continue and expand, but ultimately 
it will be successful. Um, and that's the only language they have because they're not a majoritarian movement. Even the Nazis were never a majoritarian movement. I think the highest percentage of votes they got was about 43 percent and it was declining after that. Why, why do you say it's going to succeed? Because they can marshal the forces of violence and they can decapitate already extremely weakened opposition movements. So, you know, the only real opposition movement that the Nazis had was a communist party, but we don't even have a communist party. We don't have a militant reaction. So we're far weaker and far more vulnerable. Uh, our labor unions are spent. I mean, labor strikes, even the Nazis, which were very anti-union, had to support the the uh, strikes in Berlin because they knew that if they didn't, everybody would go into the arms of the communists. So we don't even have that. We're, we're, we're in a far more fragile and debilitated state so that those popular movements which provide resistance are almost non-existence. In fact, we pretty much have to start them from scratch. So we're very easily, I'm afraid, controlled. The media is burlesque. It's, it's ridiculous and I certainly include MSNBC um, and the whole idea that Trump was elected with Russian bots is absurd. He was elected because uh, the working class was sold out. And the longer the Democratic Party refuses to address that issue, the more either support or at least acquiescence to uh, these right-wing Christian fascists we will see. I mean, there will definitely be a backlash. But what I fear is that it will be a proto-fascist right-wing backlash. And you will see, as we already seen, uh, the demonization of the vulnerable, undocumented workers. And, and, you know, as we saw with this attack in Pittsburgh, Jews are on the list. Feminists, intellectuals, uh, African-Americans. I met you just as you were breaking with the, the New York Times. And I've wanted to ask you, as I've watched you, particularly the last couple of years, speaking around the country, organizing, also engaging in direct action, debating, uh, you know, tactics uh, with Antifa or Black Bloc. What lessons have you learned that you think could help other people in transitioning from doing the war reporting that you did at the New York Times to now basically being on the road all the time, either talking about ideas that you've laid out in your books or sharing history or analysis that you found, or being there at demonstrations or in economically or politically targeted communities? What are some of the lessons you've learned that might be helpful for people trying to make sense of their own lives in the context of this political historical moment we're in? The most important lesson, having come out of distressed societies, disintegrating societies, is that every societies are extremely fragile and that the facade of that society uh, will often appear mono, monolithic and powerful. But that they crumble from within. And that's where we are. Uh, and I think people have an emotionally hard time uh, grasping that what seems so solid and permanent uh, is in fact ephemeral. So especially among the educated elites. So in, I wasn't in Sarajevo at the inception of the war, but I was in Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, during the inception of the war. And I would be out in the countryside and be stopped by the Kosovo Liberation Army and get back and tell my friends in Pristina who were multilingual, highly educated, that I'd been stopped. And they said, no, no, the Kosovo Liberation Army doesn't exist. It's just created by the Serbs uh, to justify oppression. They had no idea what was happening until literally they were hauled out of their apartments by Serbian paramilitary and put on boxcars to Macedonia. And I think that that is the most important lesson. I mean, coming out of places like Sarajevo, I can walk into a supermarket and I, I wouldn't call it a flashback, but I know what it looks like with all of the windows broken and nothing on the shelves and garbage all over the floor. And, uh, and we're not immune from that. I watched these ridiculous buffoonish figures like Radovan Karadzic, who was every bit as buffoonish as Donald Trump. And I would go back. Remember, the Nazis were also buffoonish. This is a, a Bosnian right, Serb leader. Right, the Bosnian Serb leader. And often funny. I mean, they were funny. Milosevic, by the way, was quite funny, which a lot of people didn't know. I think we're in a situation that's far more dangerous than people grasp. 
And I think the elites are particularly unable to see how dangerous the situation is. Um, the whole idea that you know the Democratic Party is going to be an instrument to protect us is a kind of willful blindness. Number one, about who they are. And number two, how precarious this moment in American history is. Chris Hedges, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. That was Chris Hedges. He's a journalist with Truthdig. He's also a professor and an author. Chris Hedges has written 12 books, including the bestsellers Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America, and War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. His latest book is America, The Farewell Tour. It just came out this year.